Buongiorno. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the life and times of one Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin is somebody you've probably heard of before. The question I want to address today is, why him? Why, of all the people, did Charles Darwin come up with a theory of natural selection? Everybody associates Charles Darwin with evolution, no matter what you think of the process. But the interesting historical question is, why him? Why not somebody else? And the short answer to that, which I hope to illustrate, is that he viewed the world through a, a set of experiences that were unique. You see, everybody has a unique upbringing, a unique genetic makeup, unique experiences. And these form the, the goggles or glasses, if you will, through which we observe future experiences and interpret those. So let's just start with the basic stuff. Charles Darwin was born on February 12th, 1809. He died April 19th, 1882. So a little bit of 82 minus 9 gives us, uh, what, 73 years he lived. Let's go back to February 12th, 1809. There was somebody else that had a big influence on world history who was also born on that exact same day. Not just February 12th, but February 12th, 1809. Do you know who shares that birth date with Charles Darwin? Question mark. That would be one Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln and Charles Darwin were born on the same day. So that's a big day for all of humanity, isn't it? All right, so Charles Darwin was born in England. And uh, this is a tourist from the tourist bureau of the area where, where he was born and raised in uh, Stratfordshire. So picture of the nice English countryside and uh, Charles was a young man who was really the kind of kid who would come home with a frog in his pocket, really. He was interested in the natural world. He had a fascination with the living world. He uh, really was obsessed with worms, earthworms. Actually, earthworms are kind of interesting. Uh, and, and he was uh, well known for writing and publishing material about earthworms and how they literally create soil and mix it up and fertilize it well before he published anything having to do with natural selection. So that's uh, where he lived, nice out in nature kind of place, not in the big city. And his father's name was Robert. Robert Darwin was known for being a large man. Uh, the, where, the point where he really couldn't get around. It became a big issue for him. Robert was Dr. Robert Darwin, physician. Uh, so uh, they lived comfortably in, uh, on a physician's salary, which is pretty good. Maybe some of you hope to cash in on that one of these days. That would be great. Darwin's grandfather was named Erasmus Darwin, also a physician. When I was defending my master's thesis, after about two hours of questioning from the faculty, the last question was from a professor who asked me, who was Charles Darwin's grandfather? I didn't know at the time. And I just, I was tired and beaten down, and I just said, um, Mr. Darwin? And uh, he pr proceeded to uh, inform me that his name was Erasmus and that Erasmus Darwin was a physician, a poet, and also dabbled in evolutionary theory. So Charles comes from a father who's a physician and a grandfather who's a physician. And there's this fella, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. He's a Frenchman. I don't like to talk about people behind their back, so here's a picture of him looking all sort of mean and stern. And he was, like a lot of people back then, seems, he was known for uh, 
being a very social creature, and like a lot of French folks, and like me when I was in France, they liked the wine. But anyway, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck uh, published in 1809, the same year Charles and Abe Lincoln were born, what he called the theory of acquired characteristics, and one of the first published evolutionary theories. So by the time the early 1800s and even the late 1700s came around, people had started to recognize that the living world was resembled the fossil world, but that the fossil world showed a history of change, where as you go back in time, organisms have changed throughout time. Does that sound like a familiar description? If you fast forward that, a change in genetic makeup of a population over time, you know what that is. That's evolution. And so the examination of the fossil record showed this pattern of change over time. And you see, up until the 1700s, the, the prevailing theory was, was very um, strict creationist interpretation, where the Earth was only 6,500 years old, and that there was one creation event, and that what we have now is the same as what was created 6,500 years ago. Well, in the 1700s, people started looking at the evidence and realizing, wait a minute, it's not all adding up here. The Earth seems to be quite a bit older, and life on Earth seems to have changed over time. And there's all kinds of going back and forth and uh, invoking Satan, and, and it's very um, a religiously volatile topic. Uh, but from the scientific standpoint, toward the late 1700s, people were starting to think, well, yeah, we need an explanation for how this has happened, a mechanism, if you will. And uh, Lamarck was one of the first ones to come up with uh, this, a mechanism for how organic evolution might have occurred. By the way, uh, as you listen to this presentation, you might want to keep track of uh, not the dates, but names and their contributions. So uh, Lamarck's theory of acquired characteristics said that an organism acquires characteristics throughout its lifetime. You know, if you go to the gym a lot, you might build up muscle mass and acquire some muscle mass. You can't go to the gym now because they're mostly closed. But uh, back when we could, you could acquire muscle mass and that you would pass that on down to your offspring. And how you would pass that down was something called pan genes. Now, we know what a gene is. A gene is a packet of information uh, that is you know, in the DNA. We know that today. And we also know what the prefix pan means, don't we? unfortunately. All are widespread. So the concept of pan genes was that information from throughout the body was sent to the gametes, which are the sex cells, either sperm or egg, and that uh, it would send information to the gametes on how to make that particular body part. So you know, your eyes would send information to the sperm or egg on what color eyes to make, or uh, your biceps muscles would send information to the sperm or egg on how to make big biceps muscles. And, and uh, so the idea of genes, and then these genes would blend in the offspring. And if you think about that, that makes some sort of sense because if you look at a child, you can see that it's got characteristics of both parents. And so this actually makes sense, this pan genes and blending idea. And when we get to genetics later on, uh, I, will, I will recall this blending theory and, and the idea of pan genes. There was an experiment to try to test Lamarck's theory where they took um, baby monkeys and cut their tails off and let them grow up and have their own babies. And then, of course, they would have tails and they would cut them off. And they did this for generation after generation. And no big surprise to us, baby mice always had tails. Uh, so then the idea is, so does that disprove? The theory of acquired characteristics or is it possible that the pan genes went to the baby mice um, the, the gametes before that they were born before the tails uh, were chopped off and that actually has um, an analog in humans where human females are already born with all their eggs formed so if there was pan genes those 
kids would have uh, the pan genes before the, the, the female child is born. So it doesn't, it doesn't support the theory, but it really doesn't refute it either. Okay, so 1809, uh, we go back to these two folks, Robert and Erasmus. Now, Erasmus was a Renaissance man, as I mentioned. He was a physician, also a poet, and uh, the father was also a poet and a writer. And uh, Erasmus was fascinated with the natural world and actually read about and, and came up with some conjectures about evolution himself. All right, so here's little tiny Charles as a little boy. Uh, he's sitting around the dinner table or around the den while the, the, the fathers are smoking their pipes in the library. And he's hearing these discussions about evolution. And the uh, family was – they weren't atheists, but they weren't overly spiritual. So it wasn't heretical to have a conversation about evolution in the Darwin household. So Charles grew up this way. If he had gr gr uh, grown up in a different family, maybe one that was raised in a very strict uh, religious environment, maybe Darwin doesn't grow up thinking it's okay to discuss evolution. Uh, maybe he, he's, he's, it's a forbidden topic or, you know, like I said, heresy. So that's not what Charles – that's one of the effects that Charles uh, – uh, one of the things that led to Charles' viewpoint on the world is that he grew up in an environment where it's okay to discuss evolution. So now Grandfather Erasmus was a physician. That's, how, that's what paid the bills, the other things he did on his own time. Father Robert was a physician and a poet. Well, the physician paid the bills. He did the other stuff on his own time. So grandfather a physician, father a physician, guess what Charles is going to be? You got it, a physician. And so uh, when Charles was a mere 16 years old, sent off to medical school. He got sent off to uh, Oxford. And so uh, here is Oxford, beautiful campus. Wait a minute. That is a beautiful campus, but it's not Oxford, is it? You recognize that place? That's where we should be right now. Tarrant County College Southeast Campus. I miss that place, and I miss you, but that's another story. Here's a little bit different of a story. Here's, here's uh, Oxford University. So they send uh, Charles, and so it's at 16, this would be, uh, what, 16 plus 9 is 25. So 1825, Charles goes off to medical school. Now, Charles, I showed you the picture of the English countryside. He wanted to wander around and study the natural world. But, uh, you know, back in the day, you did what your father told you, especially if you came from a fairly wealthy family uh, and you wanted to partake of the family inheritance and riches. You did what daddy told you to do. Uh, and also, you know, out of just general respect. Um, and, 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 you know, when I started listening to my father, my life got a lot easier. I'll tell you that. So anyway, he goes off to Oxford to study medicine. He doesn't care about medicine. He doesn't want to be a doctor. So let me ask you this. How well do you do in a study program if you don't really care about it? And I hope that's not you in biology class. I hope you care about biology class because this is a biology for majors class. So how do you do? You don't do well at all, right? You can't get motivated to study. You really don't care. And so Charles flunked it out. Yeah, they sent him home. That's a little known fact. Most people don't know that. Charles Darwin failed out of college the first time he went. Does that make him uh, not smart? No, because here we are 200 years later talking about him. So uh, he just was not following his passion. The lesson there for all of us is follow your passion. Uh, maybe it comes across a little bit on these videos, and it sure would if we were in person. But when I get going and I get in my classroom, I'm not working. I'm just being myself. I tell people this somewhat, some of this story about Darwin, even on my own time. It's just me. And so if you're going to have to have a job to pay the bills, you might as well have a job that doesn't feel like work, right? Uh, so I encourage you to find something like that yourself. So Darwin gets sent home uh, from there, Oxford, and he goes back. And now I imagine, put yourself in Charles. Your grandfather was a physician. Your father is a physician. Well-known, well-respected men 
in their community. And here you come home from Oxford in shame. And I'll bet you it was a long carriage ride up the driveway. And it was a longer walk into the den where he was waiting for his father to come in. And I, I cannot find the details on this conversation. I've looked in libraries and such. I just, uh, I even went to the Darwin Library at the Museum of Natural History in London. I can't find any evidence of this conversation, so I'm going to have to paraphrase. I'm pretty sure it went like this. Charles, whatever are we going to do with you? Are you ever going to make any of yourself? Are you ever going to become a productive citizen, husband, father? What are we going to do with you? And I don't know if that's the conversation that Charles had with his father, but I know that I too failed out of college my first try, and I had that conversation with my father, and it was unpleasant. Um, yes, I went, first time I went to college was I was studying to be an airline pilot. I did, but it's a long story. I'll tell you that in the, more about that in the genetics section. I have color deficient vision. You can't be an airline pilot with color deficient vision, color blindness. So, like Charles, I told my dad, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a biology major. The problem for Charles was that in the 1820s, there was no such thing. There was no biology major. If you wanted to study the natural world, the name of the, the, name of the program was natural theology. Natural theology. That went that, – that trained folks to – in the clergy. It was a religious degree through the, the uh, Department of Divinity, and it would train people to go out in the world as priests, as part of the clergy, to, to describe – the creation, the wonders of God. And I'll tell you, the more you study the biological world, the, the more that jumps out at you. But that's another story, too, uh, not for a science class. Uh, so uh, Charles wants to study natural theology. And so the father relents and sends Charles off to Cambridge, which is an equally prestigious and beautiful campus uh, like Oxford, it would be like getting uh, kicked out of uh, UT and going to A&M. Although, of course, A&M would be an upgrade over UT, gig'em. My daughter finally graduated from there in May, so I'm happy. Uh, father of an Aggie. So they sent Charles off to uh, Cambridge to, uh, to study natural theology. And now, whoops, and now here he is studying something he loves. How well do you do when you're studying something you love? When it doesn't feel like work or school, it feels like inspiration, and you can't wait. You're hungry. You want to learn more and more and more and more of this stuff. Well, Charles did really well and distinguished himself amongst his peers. And so hold that thought for uh, – so far, Charles is living in a, in a time and a family where it's okay to talk about evolutionary, uh, and evolutionary theory. He is uh, excelling in what would be a biology major. And then there's this fella, a Robert Fitzroy. And I have no idea why the R is capitalized, but it is. He's, he's about a couple years older than Charles, and he's a captain in the British Navy. Uh, he had risen up to the rank of captain. And he was a uh, captain of this boat, the HMS Beagle. Right? It was a, uh, a, a sloop, which is a, a man of war. If you look over here, you can see the gun ports uh, where they would point the, uh, put the cannons out. And uh, not a particularly big boat, is it? And uh, so what Captain Fitzroy, by the way, was brought up in a very strict religious family, and he was very much a fundamentalist Christian. Uh, and that plays into this story a bit. He uh, uh, is going to take his ship and crew on a trip around the world, circumnavigate the globe with a specific, a specific mission to map this coast of South America to make military maps, make a map of the coastline, take soundings, find depths, find navigational hazards uh, in a field known as cartography, cartography uh, making maps, and uh, which is kind of important, especially if you're going to be uh, uh, you know, working inshore uh, as a Navy. 
anyway, yeah, so they were going to take, take this boat, and they were going to go on a trip. Well, it was common practice on non-combat missions for the captain to take along a gentleman guest, or maybe two. The idea being that the captain is a, lo- uh, captain is a lonely job, and you can't really socialize with the, with the crew at all. Uh, and not your junior officer is really to much of any extent. And so the gentleman passenger would, would uh, have another skill that could be used along the way and was expected to dine with the captain and socialize with the captain and have somebody for uh, you know, higher levels of conversation, the captain's uh, travel partner. So that was not the least bit uncommon at all. So uh, Captain Fitzroy realized where they were going. They were going to see a lot of places that were new uh, to Euro- Europeans and uh, so that a biologist would be a good somebody to bring along. He also brought along an artist because this is before the era of photography. So oh, that's too early too. Uh, so Captain Fitzroy goes – there he is. And uh, he, he hunts up a friend of his that he knows, an acquaintance that he knows over at Cambridge, saying, hey, do you know anybody that uh, would be good for this mission? And the professor, Henslow, says, indeed I do. So this is the guy, Charles Darwin. This is who you want. So Charles Darwin gets uh, offered a place on the Beagle. Now imagine that. Here you are at this point. You're not even 30 years old yet. You just got the uh, – not at this point, not even – let's see. He's only about uh, 20, 21 years old, and uh, he gets a choice, choice internship. So that had to be pretty exciting. I mean around the world cruise, and you're going to be the science officer basically, Mr. Spock, long and prosper, you know, and – Finally, you've made something of yourself. It had to be really exciting, and he had to be proud of himself. So I imagine that he hustled back to the countryside to not only tell his father, but ask for his permission. You see, you still had to listen to your father at that point. But having had the other conversation about failing out of Oxford, this was probably a a much more pleasant trip down the driveway in a carriage. And there was probably a a, a, a skip to his step as he went into the house to talk to his father and answer the question, what are you ever going to, what are we going to do with you? Are you ever going to become a, a, a contributing member of society? And so as Charles burst into the den to, to uh, give the news to his father, he probably said something along the lines of father, father, you want to believe that I have been offered a position on the HMS Beagle to sail around the world and visit far away and strange and unknown places. And he explained it to his father, and his father said, I can't think of a bigger waste of time for a young man than to go frolicking around with the British Navy or the King's Navy. Imagine how deflating that had to be. Charles probably had to think to himself, what do I got to do to please this guy? And imagine it was really deflated. And he put up a little bit of a resistance, and uh, 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 the father said, if you can provide one person who th- this trip, then you, you shall have my permission. All right, let's stop down for a second. All right, let's say your dream is to be an astronaut, and you're 22 years old, and you get picked to be a crew member on the first mission to Mars. And your dad tells you, no. 2020, what do you do? Most of you probably say, and I would too. All right, well, I'll see you. Uh, But that's not the way it worked back then. So he went to uh, his uncle, uh, his mother's brother. And his uncle and uh, his father were, were best of friends. There's Father Robert. And uh, they were drinking buddies, hunting buddies, smoke, cigar smoking buddies. They loved to hunt pheasant. And uh, he, he, uh, Charles made his case to his uncle, uh, 
um, and I can't couldn't find a picture of him. Thomas Wedgwood is his name, and uh, the uncle basically said, "Charles, you start packing. I'll deal with your father." And so the rest is history. Charles received permission from his father to go on the trip, and uh, um, off they went. But I, I came across a letter uh, that that describes this process a little bit. Now I'm going to read it to you in my best English accent, which I hear on good authority from a really good friend of mine who's one of my best friends who's actually from England. He lives here now, and uh, he says that when Americans try to do a British accent, it's absolutely horrible and sounds like nails grating on a chalkboard, <laughs> but he's not here to critique me, so here we go. During the summer of 1831, Captain Fitzroy foresaw that the next Beagle voyage would present an ideal opportunity for collecting specimens of natural history. In his narrative of the Beagle voyage, Fitzroy wrote, Anxious that no opportunity of collecting useful information during the voyage should be lost, I proposed to the hy hydrographer, that's also map making in water, uh, one Captain Francis Beaufort, that some well-educated and scientific person should be sought for who would willingly share such accommodations as I had to offer in order to provide the opportunity of visiting distant countries yet little known. That would be Darwin. Captain Beaufort approved of the suggestion and wrote to a professor, Peacock of Cambridge, who consulted with a friend, Professor Henslow, and he named Mr. Charles Darwin grandson of Dr. Darwin the poet, as a young man of promising ability, extremely fond of geology, and indeed all branches of natural history. In consequence, an offer was made to Darwin to be my guest on board, which he accepted conditionally. He had to go ask his dad. Permission was obtained for his embarkation, thanks to Uncle Tom Wedgwood, and order was given admiralty, that's the head of the English Navy, that he should be borne upon the ship's books for provisions. The conditions asked by Mr. Darwin were that he should be at liberty to leave the Beagle and retire from the expedition when he thought proper, and that he should pay a fair share of the expenses of my table. Captain Robert Fitzroy. So that, that letter shares some of the story I told you about, and they spell things weird in England. And uh, so Darwin wanted to pay his own way. He had the money, and he didn't want to feel obligated, and he wanted to be able to leave whenever he wanted to. See, even though the Beagle was going around the world, they weren't going by themselves. The British Navy all over the place, and uh, uh, still, even though they had just got their uh, – recently had their butts kicked by us in the War of 1812, uh, which – Anyway, I digress. But so there was – he was able to send specimens and, and letters back home um, from ships going in the other direction. So off they go. They get into the Beagle, and they try to leave, and the weather's bad, and they can't get out of port. So they come back a couple days, and finally they get on their way. The Beagle is a small ship, and um, yeah, on board a ship, you have to make very good use of the room. And so in the bread room is where Darwin's stores were, just above the gunpowder magazine. Lovely. And there was so little room in here that uh, during, when he went to sleep, he would string a hammock from the ceiling. And also, uh, since this is where they kept the grain, he had some roommates of the rodentary, rodent variety, yeah, rats. And this room was really small. It's described as being about five by ten, a little bigger than a sheet of plywood thrown down. So it's a really tiny, cramped room. Of course, and the boat's not that big, so it's rocking back and forth. And it turns out that Darwin never really did develop his sea legs. He was uh, seasick for much of the time. He rarely ate dinner with Captain Fitzroy. Uh, Darwin's rather liberal. Uh, views on religion did not mesh with uh, Fitzroy's strict upbringing. Don't guess that Captain Fitzroy interviewed Darwin before 
Because Darwin might not have gotten the opportunity. Uh, they didn't like each other. They didn't like each other at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, years later, Fitzroy was a, was promoted to admiral. And uh, then many years later, after Darwin published his book in 1859, right? so Darwin's 50 years old. He, he, he sits on this stuff for uh, decades. Uh, Fitzroy was so distraught with his role in Darwin's theory of evolution uh, and what he considered heresy that he took his own life, unfortunately. So not all was uh, happy on board the, the, the blood vessel. And the, I mean, the blood vessel, the vessel. Uh, one of the masts, the mizzen mast, went right through the, the room. And if you look over here, here's somebody taking a nap in a, in a hammock. And what they, what they did is they left England. And they cruised down, and the, they were going to go to uh, the Azores and the Canary Islands. And that was going to be uh, Darwin's first introduction to tropical biology, and he was really looking forward to that. But they didn't, they weren't able to pull in because of, there was a outbreak break of the bubonic plague, so they had to bypass those places. And they uh, made it to the South American coast, and they started making their charts. And as soon as they got near land, Darwin got off the boat. He said, I'm out of here. And he got on the, onto the shore, and his, his travels down the coast mirrored the travels of the Beagle. And he was able to send off letters and, and papers and specimens that he would send. He sent a whole bunch of stuff back during the course of his cruise. They went down around the tip of South America, and they worked their way up north. And uh, when Darwin was in what's now Ascension, Chile, a town in, on the, in the uh, Chilean coast, he experienced uh, a strong earthquake, which was really played uh, a big role here. Then they went to the famous islands where the tortoises are, off to Tahiti, uh, where, where uh, they reprovisioned. It was a long stretch through here. And then they went around the northern end of New Zealand. Where's my pointer? There we go. Northern end of New Zealand. Uh, they they checked uh, the, the Taz, at coast of Tasmania, a little bit of Australia, back around the Indian Ocean, around the tip of Africa. And by this time, the crew, but they'd been gone for three years, uh, and they were really anxious to get home. And as they were, came around the, the – uh, the, not the horn, the horn is over here – the tip of Africa, um, Fitzroy decided they were going to go back to South America first. That when they had first came down and started making their maps, they weren't that good at it. And by the time they uh, had a lot of practice, they were much better. So he remapped the, the very first part. And that almost caused a, a mutiny amongst the crew. Imagine you've been gone for three years. You want to get home to your friends and family. If you're a sailor, your pay sucks anyway. So, you know, let me get off of this boat. And then all of a sudden now we're going to go spend another couple of months doing over what we've already done. I'd say, you know, hell no, but, you know, he managed to keep control. They made the rest of their their maps, and then they finally pulled into uh, back home in England a while later. Now, some other things to know about Darwin and what he saw of the world. This is a picture of Thomas Malthus, uh, author of the 17, very famous 1799 essay on populations, and so what's known as Malthusian theory where he was writing about human populations, but Darwin read this. He was, it was, he was aware of this work, and uh, it had a profound influence on how Darwin saw the natural world. Or Malthus, it's that human populations grow exponentially, but things like food supply only grow linearly. And uh, that didn't turn out to be exactly right. Uh, advances in agricultural mechanization uh, makes us more efficient at producing food. But at the time, he said, the human populations are grow too fast. That something is going to have to limit human populations. And he came up with three things, famine, disease, and war. Uh, and the, the, the basis that of Malthus' theory is there's too many people, and there's going to need to be some sort of way of limiting the size of the populations. And the way Darwin took that is that many more are born than can possibly survive. Remember back to the uh, example I used earlier in the semester about the oyster. 
where the oyster, uh, male and female oysters, broadcast their sperm and egg in a mix, and there's gazillions of larvae that are formed, but there's not that many places for a larval oyster to find a, a, a spot that's solid and settle down and take up life as an adult. And so Darwin is viewing uh, the living world through a Malthusian lens where there are many more organisms born than can possibly survive. And so some of the times that survival is going to be because that organism was better adapted to its environment. Uh, doesn't mean that it can, it, maybe that means it can run faster. Maybe that means it can fight better. Maybe like that seahorse we saw earlier, it can hide better. Maybe uh, it has a way of being, if it's an oyster, has a way of, a, a genetic way of being, let me rephrase that, uh, an adaptation that's genetic that allows it to find a, a place to settle out better. Whatever the environment calls for, if there's more than can possibly survive, some of the survival is going to be who's best adapted to the current environment. Now, of course, there's a, it's a lot more random than that, but you know we're thinking 200 years ago. So Malthus and his essay on populations had a huge effect on Darwin. Then there's this guy, Charles Lyell. Uh, the picture on the left here is uh, Lyell as an older guy, uh, but he was just a little bit older than Darwin, and they, they, they met while Darwin was at Cambridge, and they were friends. And... Uh, yeah, they they were they were they, they would go to the pub and have beer. Um, that same friend, English friend of mine, told me that there is no good in America. And of course, being a patriot, I'm like, yeah, whatever. And so when I went to England, he gave me a ten pound note and said, have a couple of beers on me. And uh, I went to England and I went to a pub and I had said beers. And I can tell you that my friend was right. The beer in England is really a lot, not just a little bit, but a lot better than the beer in the U.S. And uh, anyway, so they were. I mean, here's so here's Lyell after years of drinking English beer. And here he was probably when he was talking to Darwin. Now Lyell was a geologist, and he wrote one of the first textbooks on geology called The Principles of Geology. And in that uh, book, I don't have it, this guy written down here, but there's a guy named Thomas. I might not. Thomas might not be his first name, but last name is Hutton. And he, he wrote a paper on a concept called uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism, that's a big word. And what that means is that if you look at the world and you see the processes operating today, those same processes operated in the past. And that having a, after a long time, they could accumulate. So he was looking at a stream as it cut through a valley. And he was thinking, you know, if that stream cut through this valley for a really long time, that stream might have made this valley. And that, that was contrary to, in Hutton's time in the 1700s, the prevailing theory that was created in what we see today as a result of a series of catastrophes like the, like the flood. So Hutton starts the idea that the earth is very old. Now, they don't know how old it is. Uh, Lyell uh, takes Hutton's work and incorporates that into his principles of geology and proposed the idea of geologic time, where the old earth is unimaginably old, so that we can see the accumulation of little things in our everyday lives having big effects. Uh, if you're lucky enough to have a savings account, that's a great way to see it. You, know, you put a little bit of money in all the time. I know that's, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> uh, and then eventually, that's the idea anyway. You'd have a large amount of money. And so that over a long period of time, even little tiny changes can accumulate and be big changes. And so uh, Lyell, uh, uh, Darwin had read Principles of Geology 1. Uh, Lyell wrote a second book, gave it to Darwin. Supposedly he read that on the boat, but if you've ever been seasick, and I have, uh, you're not doing any reading while you're seasick. You're sitting at the back of the boat looking at the horizon. Uh, it's only happened to me once, but I didn't like it. I spent a lot of time at sea and some marine biology, which I'll also explain later on in the semester. So now Darwin is on the boat, and he's seeing new and exotic places 
I might add new and exotic to Europeans, there were already people there. It's hard to discover a bay when you got people that are already living there. Uh, but I digress. That's another story. Uh, so Darwin is looking at this new habitat and new things. And he's thinking, he's thinking, uh, and this is a picture out of a book my sister gave me. Uh, he's thinking about evolution and an and explanation for uh, patterns of change in populations. He's thinking that there are many more organisms born that can possibly survive. What makes them some survive and others not? He's also looking at the world as a very, very old place. Now, this is a unique set of circumstances that, that nobody has ever, ever viewed the world in these places before. So Darwin, uh, this is the, the view of uh, what he might have seen through uh, this artist's name, Conrad Martins. But Darwin is viewing all this through a unique set of lenses. So to answer the question, why Charles Darwin and not somebody else, then this is part of the reason. This is, these are the things that made him view the world differently. And I might add that you're right now building upon your view of the world. And yours is going to be you're a completely new and brand new experience that the, the thoughts that are going to go around in your head and the way that you interpret what you see in the world is going to be unique. So unique that nobody has ever been like, like you before and nobody ever will be. How about that? Here's some people that were already there. They don't look too happy, but. So uh, they get around and down here in, in this area of South America. Concepcion, Chile. Here it is today, thriving uh, metropolis, a small city. I want to point out these pretty mountains up, off in the distance. And while Charles was there, there was a catastrophic earthquake uh, estimated to be about magnitude 8, which is almost as big as earthquakes get. Uh, there has not been a magnitude 8 earthquake anywhere on Earth uh, in the last year. Uh, they happen with a frequency somewhere in the world about once a year. Big earthquake. Um, Darwin was able to see that what, what had been a shallow reef just offshore the day before, after the earthquake, had risen 30 feet. 30 feet. Picture that. That's about as tall as a telephone pole in a matter of minutes. He had been up in these mountains collecting specimens and he had noticed up here the fossilized seashells the things that were clearly living in the water at some point snail clam shells oyster shells starfish shells coral skeletons that he was finding way up here you know almost a mile high in altitude and he's scratching his head going how did these things get up here how did these things get up here and then the next day everything starts shaking and going crazy uh, it destroyed the town, caused massive fires. It was a horrible disaster for that area of the world. And then he sees the seafloor rising 30 feet from where it was the day bar. And he starts thinking about this long period of time, this unimaginably long period of time where small changes can make big differences over this long period of time. And that, heck, this earthquake was not a small change. And so he's thinking, well, you know, if there was these earthquakes happen every once in a while. Well, I can see where it could push the seabed, what was the seabed, up into these mountains. Long period of time. So in 1859, here's Darwin as an old man. This is a picture you usually see of him. Uh, on, uh, he published his book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. In 1859, he's 50 years old. Uh, he's been back from his uh, boat trip for uh, 25 years. And he was a very respected scientist before he, he published this work. He was terrified to publish it. He had nightmares of the villagers uh, with pitchforks and torches coming to burn him at the stake for heresy, which was an actually, actually a real and a legitimate fear. I mean, I think that, that kind of stuff has happened before. So he set aside some money to publish his work. At the time, you had to have a little bit of starter money. And if you made it back and made a profit, good for you. And he told his wife, when I die, publish my work. 
And she said, no, you do it. And uh, his wife, I might add, they were first cousins. Yeah, first cousins. It's, uh, and they're, the children they had were not healthy. But that's why there's most societies have prohibitions about against marrying your first cousin. So anyway, Darwin publishes the work uh, in 1859, and it had a mixed review. Uh, there was the predicted uh, cries of heresy. Uh, there was also the the uh, uh, acceptance from the scientific community, and there were some people that were both. At one point, uh, Lyell and Darwin were presenting the, the work to the Linnaean Society. The Linnaean Society is named after Charles Linnaeus, the guy who gave us that taxonomy scheme in the last presentation I gave you. And uh, by the way, that's a pretty prestigious group. You know, there might you might know somebody who's published in the Linnaean Society. You know, that person is speaking in this presentation where my master's thesis was published in the Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society. Anyway, somebody stood up and said, Mr. Darwin, then from whose side of your family do you expect to be descended from monkeys? Your mother's or your father's? All right, now I have to dispel two quick myths about the theories of evolution. One is it doesn't say people came from monkeys because one of the common questions is if people came from monkeys, why are monkeys still here? Monkeys are still here because a long, long time ago uh, we had a common ancestor that had an opposable thumb, um, and that's a, that's a story for a different day and a different argument. The other thing is that evolution – not expressly say there is no God. All right, remember the definition I gave you of evolution, a change in the genetic makeup of a population over time. Well, you can look at that theistically and say God does it. God is the one that made all these changes. God is the one who decides who survives and who doesn't. You can look at it atheistically, and I pronounce it that way because you know what the prefix a or and means. So a theist means with God, and an atheist prefix means absent or without, absent or without God. That's what. It is. So you can look at it atheistically and say, well, it's just uh, better adaptations. <coughs> Excuse me. It's um, just random chance. Uh, either way. Changes have taken place in populations over time, so it happens whether you want to say there's God or there isn't. So evolutionary theory does not say people came from God. It, I mean, came from monkeys, and it does not say there is no God. So those are also two common misperceptions. So Darwin uh, retires to his, his uh, estate. This is uh, the, the Downs house. Uh, it doesn't belong to Michael Downs. It, belong, it gets its name for – who they bought it from, and Darwin lived a pretty good long time. When we say he died when he was in his 70s, uh, this is the grave of one Charles Lyell. Charles Lyell uh, is it says right here uh, principles of geology and uh, I can't read the whole thing, but uh, he spent a long and uh, laborious life. Uh, trying to decipher the fragmentary records of the Earth's history, geology. Lyell is, is buried at Westminster Abbey in London, you know, the place where the princes and princesses get married and the kings and queens get coronated and people like Charles Lyell get buried there. Uh, and I was uh, lucky and blessed enough to be able to go on a faculty study abroad trip to London uh, to gain some international experience. And one of the things I definitely wanted to do was go to – Westminster Abbey, just go to Westminster Abbey. It's like, oh my gosh, this place is incredible. But I knew that Lyell was buried there, and so is Darwin. Uh, so I'm, I'm walking, walking around, looking in the walls. I'm looking around. I'm trying to find Darwin, the, the, Darwin's grave. They told me he's buried over there somewhere. I'm walking around. I look down, and there it is on the floor. You can see people are walking on it. And really, they just what they do is they just dig up the floor and chunk you down in there, and there you go. And uh, you're not supposed to take any pictures, but I'm not going all the way to Westminster Abbey to look at Darwin's picture. I had to, I mean, grave. I had to take a picture of it so that I can show you the picture of Robert Darwin. And all kinds of people are buried 
in Westminster Abbey. Sir Isaac Newton, uh, Fahrenheit, Celsius are all buried there. And that's just the scientists. Um, Darwin and Lyell are buried there. There's a whole bunch of poets and um, painters buried there. If you ever get a chance to go to London, definitely go to Westminster Abbey. Uh, definitely worth seeing. So anyway, uh, this brings me to the conclusion of this presentation. A couple of lessons to take from it. First of all, as I as I guided you through the life and times of Charles Darwin, did it sound to you like I was working? Or did it sound like to, like to you that I was telling a story that's near and dear to my heart? So it was. it's definitely the second or the latter, and I encourage you to find something that you feel is passionate about. Uh, then also, uh, why Charles Darwin? Why Charles Darwin? Well, we see that he grew up in a situation in a family where it was okay to contemplate and discuss evolutionary change. We see that he was born in a time where people were seeking a mechanism to explain this change in populations over time. He was experienced Malthus in that many are born then can possibly survive. And so there's not going, not everybody's going to live. And so who's going to live and produce the next generation is at least in part due to how well that organism is adapted to their environment. And Charles Lyell for giving Darwin an appreciation for how old the earth really is and that uh, the currently accepted, scientifically accepted age for the earth now is four and a half billion years. A lot of change can happen in four and a half billion years. And then, of course, the earthquake that uh, he, he observed and some other things, the turtles and the birds he saw in the Galapagos Islands. And uh, then that takes us to today. And uh, now you have, hopefully, a better understanding of Darwin. And I explained to you his view on the world. And now you also are in the process of creating your own very unique look upon the world. And with that, I will say, Arrivederci.